Next on Acme. Electricity. Oh, not again. Not again. All right. I'll admit we seem to run across electricity in a lot of items, but that's because it's all around us. In the last 10,000 years or so, electricity's gone from a mystery to a necessity. When you stop and think how important electricity is to our daily lives, it's a little scary. See, there's a little known fact about electricity. It doesn't exist. Well, all right, come on, it sort of exists. Electricity can loosely be defined as a movement of electrons in some medium that will allow that to happen. The movement of electrons can be made to do interesting things. A glance around the house ought to convince you of that. But electricity can't be held in your hand or stored or carried around in a bucket. The most common medium for electricity is metal wire. As electrons flow through the wire and other things, their energy can be converted to other types of energy. The thing that gets very little attention is how the darn electrons get moving in the first place. Anything that can induce those pesky little devils to move is called an, an electromotive force, EMF. There are five different ways to provide the electromotive force, and they're all reversible. Five different ways. See, that's one of those easy things to remember. There are five ways. Now, can I remember all five without looking at the props in front of me? Magnetism, chemical change, heat, the piezoelectric effect, and light. Now, the most often used method of generating electromotive force is magnetism. When I wave a magnet near a coil of wire, an electric current's induced in it, as the meter indicates. All the serious electrical power that we use is generated by rotating magnets and coils of wire. The effect is reversible. The electromagnetic effect runs motors, unlocks apartment lobby doors, turns the water on and off in your washing machine, among other things. Electricity and magnetism are inseparable. Following right behind magnetism in the race to provide the electromotive force is chemical change. This little bathtub is made out of brass. This is a piece of magnesium rod. And the tub is full of, don't believe me, salt water. The electromotive force is actually being created by changes taking place in the magnesium. When the magnesium is all gone, no more electromotive force. In a properly designed reaction, the effect is reversible. An external electromotive force applied to the cell will undo the chemical change. Car battery is a good example of a properly designed chemical reaction. The conversion of electron flow to heat is a real common one. Lots of things that perform other conversions also generate heat. Heat's generated in any medium that resists the flow of electricity. That actually qualifies most things. This is a piece of stainless steel wire. The wire that's found in a heater, toaster, stove, or water heater has its resistance tailored to create heat continuously without melting. Electron flow can be converted to heat, and heat can be converted to electron flow with a thing called a thermocouple. If two dissimilar metals are joined and heated, a small current flows. The effect's used on gas appliances to signal whether or not the pilot light's lit, and in some thermometers. Now, this effect takes a minute, so through the magic of editing, we're going to cut to a close-up just as the thermocouple gets hot enough. The piezoelectric effect is the least known of the five effects, and yet it's everywhere. Some substances will induce electron flow when they're stressed. And by stressed, I mean twisted or whacked. This little thing's out of a barbecue lighter. It gives enough electromotive force to cause a spark to jump a gap. The uh, snap you hear is a, it's a small hammer uh, stressing the material. A gentler version of this converts wiggles in a record groove to wiggling electric currents. The piezoelectric effect works the other way, too. If a current is made to flow in the material, it will flex. And there are a lot more of these little round disks in your life than you suspect. It's a thin wafer that uses the piezoelectric effect to give off sound. It's in all things that beep. Reading cards, calculators, computers, coffee pots. It'll probably be in your socks next. The quartz crystal is used in a lot of electronic things to regulate speed. Put into a proper circuit, it can be made to flex and relax at 
regular intervals. Those intervals depend on the size of the crystal. It regulates watches, clocks, turntables, computers, and keeps all of our radio and TV transmitters on the right wavelengths. A light bulb can be considered to be just a special case of resistance heating. The heater inside gets hot enough to emit visible light. The light emitting diode emits light directly with, without creating heat. The light emitting diode has made it to almost every electric appliance in one way or another. It's very cheap and it lasts forever. Funny thing about them, the light emitting diode will also cause an electromotive force when light falls on it, but it's very feeble and I can't really demonstrate it. Solar cells are much better at generating EMF. They're, they're used mostly in things orbiting our planet and uh, some calculators. There's even a pack of solar cells you can get that will recharge a dead car battery. Free electricity. Well, solar cells ain't free, let me tell you. But there you have it. Five different ways to generate an electromotive force and five matching ways to use that force. So, what is electricity? I don't know. As a matter of fact, why don't you return your next electric bill unpaid? After all, you're being charged for something that doesn't exist.